How does VA assess and rate severity for non-physical disabilities as compared to physical ones? Basically, they do it based on primarily the extent to which it interferes with your ability to work, what they call occupational impairment. But they also consider what they call social impairment, meaning your ability to maintain effective relationships with others. Um, like how many times you've been divorced, for example? That certainly can count in there, but also just how do you get along with coworkers? You know, can you maintain a marriage or a, an intimate relationship with someone? You know, all of those things factor in, but they start by looking at what they call occupational impairment, meaning how well can you function in the workplace? And as we know, one of the things that happens for people who have been exposed to unusual, stressful kind of situations is that they are likely to develop either PTSD or specified trauma disorder. Welcome to the Victory Over VA podcast. A podcast about empowering veterans to overcome denied disability claims. Each week, we deliver critical insights to help you understand the disability process, veterans' benefits, and how to take control of your legal rights. Now here's your host, Tony Francis Jackson. Welcome to Victory Over VA, your guide to unlocking your VA disability benefits. This is our podcast. So welcome. I'm Francis Jackson. This is my daughter, Alexandra Jackson, and we practice at Jackson and McNichol doing veterans disability law. So what's this about? Well, it's about veterans. We are here to talk about every week issues for veterans seeking disability compensation from the VA. We are here to talk about how to get justice for those veterans. And this show is for everybody who cares about veterans. It's obviously for veterans, but it's also for families of veterans, friends of veterans, folks who are supporting and helping veterans who are suffering from disabilities to move forward. And today, we're going to talk about non-physical injuries and how that relates to VA compensation. To start with, can you just sort of clarify the scope of VA disability benefits as far as covering conditions that aren't just physical injuries? Sure. VA disability covers all disabilities, physical, mental, whatever they are, that are connected to service for those who served honorably in the various branches of the military in the United States. So the specific kind of injury doesn't really matter as long as it results in a disability and we can tie it back to the time in service. Okay. How does VA differentiate as part of their process for you know evaluation? Because you got to tell them something, right? You have to claim a certain thing. You have to make a claim, and you have to tell them what you're claiming. But in terms of differentiation, really, the differentiation comes in how they use different processes to evaluate the claim. So for example, if it's a mental health claim, they would have it evaluated by someone who's a psychologist or psychiatrist or mental health specialist whereas a physical injury would be more likely to be evaluated by someone who specializes in physical medicine like um, an orthopedist or perhaps a neurologist. It just depends on the, the nature of the injury. Okay. What are some of the common misconceptions about eligibility of veterans who have non-physical disabilities for disability benefits? Well, I think the most common one is that those folks are not eligible. So many people who have been in the service are exposed to events that are outside the norm and result in either a 
what, what would be characterized as a mental illness like PTSD or depression or anxiety or suffer from things like a traumatic brain injury that are not clearly physical injuries even though uh, with TBI for example the, the underlying cause is physical but, but the symptoms are not uh, as directly physical. Okay. Can you give an idea of the spectrum of mental health conditions and kind of TBI, things that manifest in ways that you can't just look and go, yeah, that's broken, sure. that VA recognizes? Sure. The VA recognizes any mental illness that is listed in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5, which is the American Psychiatric Association's compendium of all mental illnesses. Usually just called the DSM, right? Just called the DSM-5. But the most common ones that we see in veterans are PTSD, anxiety, depression, specified trauma disorder, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. There is also the traumatic brain injury, which is not technically a mental issue, but has mental function manifestations of this physical injury to the brain. Can you talk a little bit more about like the bipolar and schizophrenia sort of stuff? I know that VA differentiates between what they consider you know, genetic and acquired disabilities. That's certainly true. For example, if you have a personality disorder, for example, the VA treats that as a, an individual developmental issue and not as a, a condition that you develop in the service. But going to your specific point about bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Because I think a lot of people think of those as just purely genetic. People do, and there's certainly some evidence to suggest that, but here's the part that ties it to service. The way the laws are structured, if you have a condition that manifests itself while you're in the service, then that condition is ordinarily considered to be service-connected, even if it wasn't caused, if you will, by service, as long as it happened during service. Weren't there also some recent studies that were showing that you can be genetically predisposed but not manifest it without some sort of intense stress? Certainly that's an issue, but let me just circle back. There's also some very important research that shows that both bipolar disorder and schizophrenia tend to manifest in the late teens and early 20s. That's the period when most people enter the service. I mean, obviously you can enter the service later, but it, that's less common. Most folks who go in the service go in the late teens or early 20s, and that's the primary period during which both schizophrenia and bipolar disorder tend to start. As you mentioned a moment ago, there's also some very interesting research that suggests that even people who are genetically disposed, predisposed, to either schizophrenia or bipolar disorder may well not ever exhibit the symptoms, may not develop full-blown bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. But if you expose those folks to severe stress, then that can cause the symptoms to manifest themselves, to become present. And obviously, the whole process of basic training imposes enormous stress on people both physically and mentally, and the research certainly suggests that can cause folks who have a genetic predisposition but don't actually have bipolar disorder or schizophrenia to develop it. So kind of like diabetes, you know, your dad was the only one of his entire set of siblings who never got it. That's right, and that's because he exercised and they didn't, as far as I can tell, but you're right. Uh, the fact is you have a genetic predisposition to something doesn't mean you're going to get it. It just means that you may have a higher chance of getting it than somebody else. Okay. How does VA assess and rate severity for non-physical disabilities as compared to physical ones? Basically, they do it based on primarily the extent to which it interferes with your ability to work, what they call occupational impairment. But they also consider what they call social impairment, meaning your ability to 
maintain effective relationships with others. Like how many times you've been divorced, for example? That certainly can count in there, but also just how do you get along with coworkers? You know, can you maintain a, a marriage or a, an intimate relationship with someone? You know, all of those things factor in, but they start by looking at what they call occupational impairment, meaning how well can you function in the workplace? And as we know, one of the things that happens for people who have been exposed to unusual, stressful kind of situations is that they are likely to develop either PTSD or specified trauma disorder. And so those conditions tend to make it difficult for them to interact easily with others in either a work or social setting. And so the degree of that problem is what leads to various ratings by the VA. What kind of documentation or evidence is most compelling when you are putting in a claim for a disability like that? Well, certainly the, the most critical uh, documentation is an opinion by a psychologist or psychiatrist or someone with a specialty in mental health explaining what happened in service, what the condition is now, and how those two are tied together. But in addition to that, it's important to document the underlying circumstances. For PTSD, for example, the VA generally requires proof of what they call a stressor, a particular event that imposed unusual stress on the person such that it could cause PTSD, such as being in combat, being shot, being seeing fellow soldiers injured or shot, but also can happen in non-combat situations, auto accidents, seeing a fellow soldier commit suicide or be electrocuted. There are all sorts of... Uh, Processing bodies that are coming back. Especially, yes. There are all kinds of, of things that unfortunately are hard on the human psyche and can cause these conditions to develop. Can you share a success story about a veteran who got their benefits for something that was non-physical? Just highlight any of the unique challenges that might have gone on in that? Sure. We had one case. I mean, there are a variety, but just to take an example. We had one case where a gentleman was in the service. He was actually assigned to a veterinary unit. And when he left the service, applied for benefits, and said that he had been hospitalized for mental health. The VA kept turning him down, saying there was no record of his having been hospitalized for mental health. We started representing him, and we were able to get his denial remanded by the court and develop the case. And we looped around a couple times at the court because the VA was very resistive about getting some records. But we finally were able to get what are called the morning reports for his unit, which showed that he wasn't present in his unit at the times that he had said he was in the hospital. And uh, we actually found entries, one of which was assigning a, a, another person in his unit to accompany him to the hospital. So we ultimately were able to demonstrate that he in fact was hospitalized and finally got his actual records from the hospital. But, you know, that's just one instance. There are lots of different situations where people have difficulty in proving mental illness cases and TBIs. TBI in particular is a difficult one to prove, but I often use the example of two folks in the Middle East who are in a Humvee and the Humvee gets blasted by one of these improvised explosive devices that the insurgents use there and one person loses his foot. The VA can see that. They can rate it no problem. They, that person is going to get his benefits. But another guy who's in the same vehicle in the back on the other side gets his head bounced off the roof and he has a traumatic brain injury from a severe concussion. The VA can't see that, can't rate it, and often requires a lot of effort to get them to recognize that condition. Usually, you have to have neuropsychological testing that shows particular kinds of brain functions are not working properly and that they're consistent with 
a blow to the particular part of the head and that sort of thing. But it can be done. It's just those can be a challenge. And how does the VA approach conditions like PTSD, anxiety, and depression in their evaluation process? Well, they, they have a fairly straightforward approach to it. They look at the circumstances and they, uh, generally speaking, will get a, an evaluation by a psychologist or a psychiatrist and ask that person to evaluate whether the condition is present and if so, whether it's related to service. And that's their baseline for approaching those cases. They get an evaluation asking, what's the condition? Is it related to service? What if you've got multiple diagnoses or you've got different diagnoses from different people? That happens a lot, actually. But what is... Kind of uh, like the foot. It's a little less easy to tell which it is. <laughs> kind of like that. Yeah. What happens in a lot of cases is that people have what if you kind of try to break it down by specific diagnoses, they have either intertwined or overlapping, if you will, diagnoses. It's pretty common for people to have both PTSD and depression or PTSD and anxiety or anxiety and depression. A lot of those things just seem to have kind of overlapping symptoms, if you will. But the short version is that the way the VA is supposed to approach those cases, and, and usually does, is to look at the symptoms. And if the symptoms match up to a recognized diagnosis, then the next question is, okay, is that diagnosis related to service, and if so, how? But they can have a situation where some diagnoses are related to service, some are not, and still have the entire constellation of symptoms be recognized by the VA as a service-connected disability and compensated. Why? Because if the VA can't separate out the symptoms from one diagnosis from another, the way the system works is they have to assume that all of them are related to the service-connected disability. If, on the other hand, the examiner is able to kind of parse out, well, these symptoms are related to this condition, these are not, this condition is related to service, this is not, then the VA can compensate only the ones that are service-connected. But in mental health, it's challenging to separate them out neatly into one diagnosis or another in most cases. What if you make a claim and you screw up and you put the wrong thing or whatever? Well, that's not supposed to make a difference anymore. For, for many years, the VA would approach mental health based on the diagnosis that the veteran claimed. So, for example, if you made a claim for PTSD, but the examiner said, eh, you don't have PTSD, you have depression, the VA would stop there. They would say, oh, you claim P PTSD, you don't have it, go away. The court a few years ago in a case called Clemens basically said the VA can't do that. that it's not up to the veteran, who is not an expert in mental health, to decide what the correct diagnosis is. It's up to the VA that has experts to decide what the correct diagnosis is. And the diagnosis in some ways is secondary. The question is, what's the constellation of symptoms, and is that constellation of symptoms a mental health condition that's related to service, regardless of the diagnosis? But it matters with PTSD though, right? Is it there does. specific criteria that vets with non-physical disabilities have to meet to establish connection to service? Only for PTSD. The service, sorry, the Veterans Administration treats PTSD differently than other mental health conditions. They require evidence of a particular stressor which caused the PTSD. There is, however, a significant exception for folks whose claims for PTSD are based on a personal assault of some sort, sexual or other physical assault, then 
the VA will also look at kind of secondary levels of information. For example, you know, was this person performing well before this incident and then their performance suddenly deteriorated? Or was the person doing fine and then suddenly started drinking heavily? They will look at these kind of surrounding circumstances as evidence of PTSD in those kinds of cases. Are there any situations where VA just assumes you had a stressor, like it's presumptive kind of? Really only in combat. If you were engaged in combat with the enemy, that, that's considered sufficient. So if you were in Vietnam and you can show that you were stationed at a particular base and the base was subject to a rocket and mortar attack, for example, by the Viet Cong, then the VA will say, okay, that's a sufficient stressor, and they will move on to looking at the claim on the assumption that there's a sufficient stressor. How does the appeal process vary for claims centered on non-physical versus physical disabilities? The appeal process really doesn't vary. It's a question of the evidence that varies. For non-physical injuries, the evidence is going to be psychological evaluations, psychiatric evaluations, that kind of, uh, of evidence, plus evidence of symptoms, um, observations by people around the veteran about their depression or anxiety or irritability or difficulty getting along with others, rather than in physical cases where the observations are going to be complaints of pain, difficulty lifting, whatever it is for the physical uh, kind of symptoms. Are there any common pitfalls people make when applying for non-physical disabilities? Yeah, there are two really big ones, I think. One is a failure to get appropriate documentation, medical documentation from a physician or psychologist linking one or more events in the service to the current disability. That's one. The other is that people often fail to explain what actually was going on in service that led to the problems. It's not always readily apparent from reading someone's service records what kind of uh, events were going on around the person that caused them depression, for example, or anxiety. And so it's important to explain and develop that just as it's important to have good medical evidence. How does VA handle claims stemming from traumatic experiences or moral injuries that might not manifest at all physically? I know there's been some really interesting studies about being in the service and racial issues. So basically constant hostile work environment. Yeah, those are always challenging cases. In fact, as I remember, you won one for a gentleman who had been subject to racial animus in the service, a Hispanic gentleman, and he was in the service in the 50s, as I recall, and took years and years for us to get to the point that he finally was granted service connection. But it was in his 90s, in fact. Yeah. He'd been applying since, you know, the 50s. Yeah. It's tougher to prove those. I mean, that's just the reality. But as you demonstrated in that case, it can be done. It's a question of marshalling the, the evidence and getting good reports. How crucial is continuous medical documentation therapy records, et cetera, if you're going after this sort of claim? Well, I see we're running out of time, so let me try and answer that quickly. It's really helpful to have good documentation showing that the condition has progressed over time or has been present over time. But that's not critical. The critical point is that you demonstrate that the condition exists currently, that there are underlying events in the service that show that this started in service or uh, was present in service and a good medical opinion tying the two together. For example, I represented a veteran who had lots of difficulty in the service, was actually seen for uh, mental health evaluation, then got into a, a brawl with the MPs in which he was 
quite severely beaten, developed PTSD from that. And the VA tried to turn him down on the basis that his brawl with the VA, sorry, the with MPs. the MPs. <laughs> Most of our clients <laughs> have had a brawl with the VA, right? <laughs> exactly. But his brawl with the MPs caused him to have PTSD, and that was willful misconduct on his part. But in fact, we were able to demonstrate from the service records, particularly the personnel records, that he was having severe emotional difficulties in the service before this event. This was kind of just the culmination. So on that note, we're wrapping up today's episode, but thank you all for tuning in, and don't forget, watch next week's podcast. Thanks for joining us this week on the Victory Over VA podcast. Make sure to visit our website, veteransbenefits.com slash podcast, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Spotify, or via RSS, so you'll never miss a show while you're at it. If you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. If you like this show, you might want to check out our free consultation to see how we can help you with your denied claim. Simply go to veteransbenefits.com and fill out the form. You fought for us. Now let us fight for you. And be sure to tune in next week for our next episode.